All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, you're in the right place for Veolia's webinar on low level active radioactive waste. Uh, we're going to give it just a second here. We'll let a couple more people log in. All right, people are still coming in. That's fine. Uh, it is right 10 o'clock central here, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we're very happy to have you here. Good. Looks like more folks are jumping in. We're just getting started. Uh, welcome to Violi's webinar on understanding low-level radioactive waste definitions, regulations, and treatment options. Um, I'm Jim Dykeis, and I'll be your moderator today. I'll introduce our speakers in a moment, but uh, one thing we'd like to do uh, just to kind of get things going is uh, see how everybody is feeling about uh, post Thanksgiving uh, pre Christmas holidays. Um, so what do you want most this holiday season? Uh, jump into the poll there. You should see that now um, on the left side. Uh, you'd like all your Amazon packages to be delivered. Um, a personal shopper, world peace, or <laughs> topically related to get your last Low-level Radley shipment out the door. All right, votes are coming in. Very good. It's always interesting. I love seeing what what people are up to. All right, we'll give it a uh, whole oh, five or ten more seconds here. I can see the percentage, but I can't see the percentage of the attendees. So it looks like you're all. All right, this is good. All right, we're going to close it in about five. Four, three, two, one, and oh, just had a couple more votes come in. Oh, then they're going like crazy. All right, I'm going to close the poll um, so we can get to our content. But this is great. All right, and poll. We had uh, a lot of visionaries. The winner by 54% is world peace. Uh, <laughs> that's encouraging. And then the uh, second at 20, about half of that is to get your packages on time. And then a very close tie with a personal shopper and to get your rad waste shipment out the door. Um, so thanks for uh, joining us with that. It's always kind of fun just to see where people are at. Uh, so as I said, I'm the marketing director. I'll also be the moderator today. It's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers, um, Roger Fortin and Liza Crass. Roger is one of our uh, radioactive waste managers for one of our branches. And I call Roger uh, A to Z. He's involved in everything from uh, coding projects, uh, completing a waste profile, um, all aspects of the of the project, including getting permits, uh, writing the procedures, writing safety procedures, showing up with a truck in the manifest. Um, some of you probably know Roger, um, so he's been with us for over 30 years, actually I think probably 31 years, um, and a lot of that with our reactive chemicals group. Liza is the director nationally of uh, this program. So she has uh, responsibility and works with Roger and his counterparts and our other branches. So she is uh, where the buck stops for making sure that all projects uh, occur in a safe, compliant, cost effective, and a consistent manner. So um, these are our two speakers today. Uh, a few housekeeping comments before we jump into this. Um, Roger and Liza will walk through the, the content. I'll turn my camera off so not to distract from them. Uh, we hope to have about 10 minutes for questions, 10 to 12 minutes at the end. You will see, uh, if I go over to the chat, um, there we go. Um, we've got uh, two ways that you can get, get a hold of us. One is a chat, and again, I don't really care how you do it. So if you can't hear us, for instance, um, put it in there if the slides aren't advancing. Uh, I've set them all to private so we don't distract each other. But in, and if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. I prefer you put them in the Q and A. Um, that makes it easy for me as a moderator to see where they are. Uh, but either either place uh, is fine for me. And then I'll we'll get those questions at the end. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, so at the end of the day, hopefully the end of today, maybe tomorrow morning, we'll send you a PDF of the slide deck, as well as a YouTube link to the recording. Um, what else? Uh, I may move these slides around. Matter of fact, I think I do for the next, uh, excuse me, I may move our thumbnails around so we don't cover content. And if there is some sort of a, a technical problem, which we did experience once, if a bunch of you are saying the slides aren't advancing, I will hit a reset and it takes about 15 seconds and it just relaunches uh, the webinar. 
Um, so with that, uh, let's go ahead and get started. So first, we're just going to do a very brief overview on Veolia. Some of you uh, are our customers. Uh, some of you may not be as familiar with us. So we just have a couple quick slides on that. And then as we've kind of talked about uh, what are what is a low-level radio, radioactive waste, so we'll do some definitions, how to prepare on-site and off-site, um, talk about the regulations, and then treatment options. And then what we're trying to get to is your specific questions, because we know that that's why you signed up. Um, I have a, a, a slide just to make our attorneys happy. Uh, this is for informational purposes only. If you've got a specific legal EHS uh, question, please consult your own um, legal counsel for that. So, this is where I need to uncover our revenue. Um, let's put it over there. So, Veolia uh, is a global company providing services in three main areas, uh, water, waste, and energy. About $30 billion last year, 180,000 employees. And then you can see over on the left-hand side of the screen, we have about 7,000 in the United States with about $2 billion in revenue. Um, we could probably do an entire webinar just on this, but I would refer you to our new uh, website, uh, activities.veolianorthamerica.com. Uh, it's kind of a cool little interactive map and you can figure out what that means. So um, that is uh, Veolia very quickly. I'll put us back in the upper right here. So today it's about low level radioactive waste. You see the star there. Uh, Liza is headquartered in Flanders, New Jersey, but the program is delivered and administered nationally. And uh, so you can see the other locations, which you may be closer to. Um, it's uh, a, a wide selection of services on the left that you see there. Uh, but we do offer a broad range of services uh, to our customers. And that includes treatment and disposal services, as well as uh, focused on circular economy solutions. And we'd love to talk to you about any other uh, waste questions you have. Um, but let's go ahead and get on to the content today. Um, so, Liza and Roger, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jim. So, uh, what is low-level radioactive waste? Uh, we'll get right into some, some definitions for you. Uh, a specific license is required for the use of radioactive material in day-to-day -day business. Uh, users must submit an application with the NRC or their state agency, and a license is issued with company name on it. Uh, NRC regs also uh, provide a general license for the use of byproduct material contained in certain products that have been manufactured and distributed in accordance with a specific license issued by the NRC or agreement state. Uh, so the manufacturer has a specific license with their company name on it, and the end user can purchase equipment as a general licensee uh, with only the minimal NRC general requirements, uh, for instance, control or maintenance and uh, transfer reporting of the equipment. Uh, exempt from licensing would be items that are manufactured under an exempt license or otherwise exempt radioactive materials like smoke detectors, uh, thoriated welding rods, certain sealed sources, and items for uh, teaching purposes. Low-level radioactive waste uh, is radioactive materials or items that, uh, the, that is not spent fuel, high-level transuranic or mill tailings. Uh, mixed waste uh, is usually out-of-date materials or contaminated items, equipment, PPE, uh, but uh, mixed waste is also EPA or hazardous waste, uh, EPA regulated. Uh, natural occurring materials or NORM would be natural radioactive elements uh, found in the environment uh, like natural potassium, natural thorium, natural uranium. Um, and again, uh, such, such uh, that these are not enriched, depleted, processed or manufactured. Technologically enhanced norm uh, as a result of human activities such as manufacturing, mineral extraction, or water processing. Uh, water processing. Uh, these are radionuclides where uh, they, they get concentrated uh, because of that process. And because they get concentrated, that's when you have possible issues with the higher than background radiation levels. 
which can happen in, in those uh, manufacturing processes or just when you have uh, natural materials, rocks with a lot of uranium and that or uh, thorium in them, uh, all kind of in one place. Uh, again, norms not regulated by the NRC, but it is regulated in many states. So some low level types uh, of uh, waste, uh, you certainly have uh, dry active waste, which is probably the most common, just contaminated materials and solids. Uh, liquid scintillation vials, which we see a, a, a lot of here in the Northeast. Uh, it's usually a rad sample or a wipe test uh, for, that is done for contamination. Um, and Bader or 96 well plates are similar, just on a much smaller scale. There's animal and biological wastes, uh, carcasses, tissues, animal bedding, or sharps that were used uh, for injection. Uh, aqueous wastes or uh, water-based mixtures and buffers. Uh, again, be careful with those. They could be a hazardous waste as well uh, if they pH or are corrosive or if they contain rubber metals. Sludges, tank bottoms, uh, resins and filters, those are key spots to be concerned with uh, the buildup of those norm materials that could uh, you could be generating. Uh, then there's contaminated equipment or contaminated lead that was used for shielding. Uh, check sources for items that you uh, or meters that you use. Uh, uranium and thorium compounds, which Liza will go into uh, in more detail soon here. And uh, devices containing sealed sources as well. As Roger mentioned, those last two bullet items, we're going to go into a little bit more detail. Uranium and thorium are considered source material regulated under 10 CFR Part 40 of the NRC regulations. And these materials can be possessed either under a specific license or under a general license. Focusing on uh, items that you can see here, uh, like this thorium nitrate material, um, we see a lot of these out in industry. These are usually possessed under a general license. So the manufacturer holds the license and when you go to purchase it from a Mallinckrodt or a JT Baker or a Fisher Scientific, you receive it under a general license. And nobody monitors how much you receive, but there actually are regulations uh, regarding that. So um, you can only have 3.3 pounds of these compounds under general license at any one time or 15.4 pounds per calendar year. And these are new limits from uh, 2014 where the limits changed to be a lot lower. And we have seen some cases where, you know, people stockpile some of these things and uh, they can encroach on those limits pretty quickly. So um, if you do have them, might be a good idea to take an inventory, double check your quantities and make sure you're still within that general license requirement. Um, if you do have these nitrate compounds, these ones are considered mixed waste. Like Roger explained, it's something that's hazardous and radioactive. So these are oxidizing materials. Uh, oftentimes they can be rocked up in cement with a waste analysis plan for in-container treatment, remove that oxidizing characteristic, and then manage it only as a radioactive material. Keep in mind with those uh, nitrates, however, that there are some states where the uh, placing into cement may be considered treatment. I know, for instance, in the state I'm in, Massachusetts, uh, you would need a treatment permit to do that. So it's often to shift as uh, thorium nitrate as a mixed waste because of the expense or time to uh, obtain the treatment permit. It's a lot more expensive that way, but a lot less uh, effort. That's a great point. Thanks, Thanks Raj. Well, um, there's also some exemptions for source materials. Uh, these are in uh, 10 CFR 40.13. Uh, the biggest one being mixtures and solutions with a really small amount of material in them, less than 0.05%. Then there's also some specific exemptions like thorium and gas mantles, because who doesn't love camping? Uh, thoriated welding rods, um, ceramics, uh, fiesta ware, if you've got some really old materials lying around your house, uh, there's some magnesium thorium alloy um, exemptions and then some additional ones for uranium also. Uh, devices and articles being the last type of, that we're gonna talk about today. These are devices containing a sealed source, a small amount of, uh, of source with a lot of radioactive material crammed into it. 
and they're usually surrounded by an inert material and oftentimes also a big hunk of lead to maintain a, a large level of safety for the end user. So density gauges, fill level gauges, gas chromatographs contain an electron capture detector with a nickel 63 foil, uh, liquid scintillation counters have a tiny little bead source in them that's usually cesium-137 or barium-133. Then there's a lot of common materials like smoke detectors, 99.9% .9 of which are exempt, containing emery cesium-241, and the self-powered uh, luminescent exit signs, which can actually contain a very large amount of tritium on the order of 10, 15, 20 carries sometimes. When you buy these materials from the manufacturer to use in your site, um, again, sometimes they're under your specific license, depending on how high they are and what state you're in. Um, and other times you receive them under a general license. And when you get them under a general license, they come with uh, an insert or a pamphlet that explains your responsibilities. And if you're like most people, it looks like an insert in a box and you toss it in the trash. But it's actually a pretty important document. It explains the responsibilities that you as the end user have for that device. And some of the requirements that are included could be um, an inspection, uh, six months or a year, sometimes three years, depending on the manufacturer and what the item is. And this could be a leak test of the material to make sure it's still uh, in good condition, um, a review of the label to make sure that the label is legible and still attached to the device. Uh, if it's got a shutter mechanism to manipulate that shutter to the on-off position and make sure when it's off, uh, the beam is not protruding from that device uh, and causing an exposure. Um, and again, you have to review this pamphlet to make sure that you're meeting all these requirements. Uh, also in the regulation, there's actually a two-year limit for devices. Um, if you haven't used that material within two years, you're required to uh, put the shutter in the locked position uh, and do leak tests. If it's going to go past that two-year mark, then you really need to consider shipping that material either back to the manufacturer or out for disposal. Uh, those are your two best options. If the manufacturer is still in business, best to try to hit up the manufacturer, um, realizing that you may need to ship that on your own, so you may need some assistance with that. And if the manufacturer is not available or the process becomes too cumbersome, you can certainly contact a service provider to ship it for disposal. Um, for many states, you're required to register these devices. And when you register them, they'll that's an annual process. And they'll ask you every year to make sure that you still have those devices in your possession. And like the source material, there are a lot of exemptions for some devices timepieces containing tritium or promethium-147, static eliminators for precision balances that contain polonium-210, some spark gap tubes uh, also have some um, exemptions. So be wary that you could have a material and then not be subject to any of these requirements as well. So preparation for on and off-site management. Um, it's really all in the details and record keeping when it comes to this uh, material uses with clear and defined procedures for the use and tracking of materials from receipt to disposal make things much easier for themselves. And again, if you're doing the things on the right side uh, for on site management, you'll really be helping take care of a lot of the things on the right side uh, for off site management. So uh, characterization and segregation by waste type kind of go hand in hand here. Um, you'll want to make sure that you're characterizing materials to either be rad or non-rad to start with, uh, recra or non-recra, uh, and segregating them accordingly. Uh, you may need analyt analytical data or SDSs. Uh, you'll want to separate your liquids from your solids, uh, your short-lived isotopes from your long-lived isotopes, and probably uh, also keep your high dose materials uh, shielded separately from your low dose materials. So again, these two items here uh, are both going to go uh, help you with your approvals here on your offsite side. Um, packaging, 
packaging is uh, largely dependent upon uh, the where you're shipping it to and their waste compliance or waste acceptance criteria to the offsite facility you're shipping to. Um, so again, you'll want to check those acceptance criteria uh, prior to packaging uh, because it saves you a lot of time on the other end. Uh, but at a minimum, you'll want to keep all rad materials uh, sealed in poly liners and double bagged inside the drums. Uh, we recommend that any bulk liquids, uh, you know, anything larger than lab pack quantities, certainly be overpacked as well uh, to protect uh, any possible leaks or spills. Uh, the overpacked drum is much cheaper. Uh, it's kind of an insurance policy. Um, labeling, you want to make sure that you label uh, your items uh, well, and Liza's going to go into that a little bit further uh, in the future. But again, uh, that's going to help you comply with your DOT and EPA regs here um, so that things on the, outs on the outbound can be properly labeled. Uh, inventory uh, records for accumulation, uh, Again, you'll want to keep great records, as I, I said, in great details so that you know your isotopes, your activities, uh, the dates on those items, so that this will help with your shipping papers. Um, container inspections and surveys. Uh, again, you'll want to make sure that the their containers are proper for the material that you're packaging in. Um, certainly, if they're mixed waste, you'll want to make sure that they're appropriate DOT containers. Uh, you'll want to make sure they're not leaking, that they're in good shape, uh, and that you've done surveys, both uh, dose rate surveys and contamination surveys. So again, that helps you and is a requirement here for your offsite uh, as well. And you'll want to make sure that you secure against unauthorized access or removal uh, on site because you want to make sure that the right people are handling it, the trained people, and they're not spreading contamination. A couple other things off site here is that you want to make sure that your drum uh, Type A certs are uh, handy and you keep those on file if you're shipping in type A containers. Again, we mentioned the drum surveys, but uh, most importantly also make sure that your, your container, uh, your carrier, excuse me, is authorized to transport the materials that you're shipping, uh, that they have a hazmat registration, uh, that they're well insured, and that they obtain or you obtain any state specific permits that are required. Just one note on those state-specific permits, Raj. Um, sometimes you can't rely on the carrier to have all the right permits. Some of the permits are generator-specific, meaning the shipper or the licensee has to apply for the permit, and it could be as specific as exactly what they put on the truck in terms of isotopes and activity. Thanks, Liza. Okay. Uh, great. Before we jump into this next section, um, I got a quick poll, uh, another one just to test uh, the temperature of you, our audience. What's your most pressing issue right now uh, related to managing your LLRW? Uh, if we don't have yours up here, maybe check one that is the next most pressing. Obviously, we couldn't uh, have them all. Um, go ahead and cast your vote. Getting train, ways to reduce, budget, storage space, and record keeping. All right, everybody's actively voting. Um, while you're voting, uh, I have seen a couple questions come in. By all means, keep. Uh, Use either the chat or the Q&A to ask those, and we'll make sure that Roger and Liza get to those at the end. All right. Um, slowing down a little bit. Let's give it about five seconds. Get your vote in. Okay. Now close it and closed. All right. So um, the most current uh, among our audience, the most pressing issue is getting training for all people involved. So 37%. Um, next closest, 23% sufficient budget. And then almost a three-way tie for uh, reducing volumes, finding storage space, and uh, record keeping. So, all right. Thank you very much. I'll uh, turn my camera back off and turn back over to Roger and Liza. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Our next topic is going to be a little bit about the regulations and some health and safety information for you also. 
When you generate your low-level radioactive waste, the regulations indicate a few different methods you can use to dispose of that material. You've got your regulatory citation there if you do want to peruse it. Uh, the most common one, of course, is to send your material to a licensed low-level radioactive waste processing or disposal facility. And it's usually uh, pretty cumbersome to send to a disposal facility, so most people for small quantities do use processors directly. Another option, which we'll talk about a little later, is by decaying storage or release in effluents or sanitary sewer systems. Uh, what's probably little known is if the, one of these options don't really work for you, you've got some really bizarre waste stream, you can apply to the NRC or your state authority for another method. You'll have to quantify that method, validate it, and indicate why it's a good method. But that is always an option if you've got something that's you know really on the bizarre side. Um, we did have 14% people say they were looking for ways to minimize their waste volumes. So we'll cover a little bit about waste minimization. When you file your specific license application, you're indicating that you have a waste minimization plan in place and some methods that you're going to use to try to limit the material that you generate. So we've listed the top four methods here. Uh, segregation, for example, keeping your non-radioactive materials separate from your radioactive materials. And I know sometimes when you're working, it's easier just to throw everything in the same bin, uh, but a little bit can really add up to, to a long way. So if you can segregate your materials, it's better to do that. Another method is decaying storage. Again, we'll, we'll cover that topic a little bit more later. Um, you can try to reduce your volume. You can do this by, you know, landfills occupy a lot of space. So the less volume you have, um, the less space you'll take up in our very valuable landfill space here in the U.S. You can cut materials down to size. You can compact materials as well uh, at your location, which would also help with your storage space if that was a concern. Uh, do keep in mind, however, if you compact material, um, that you have got to have other procedures in place. Compaction could spread radioactive contamination to your storage area, to personnel, and to the outside of the containers. So you'll have to be wary of that and make sure that you've got procedures in place to address those concerns. And another final method for waste minimization is substitution. Um, this could include um, using non-radioactive material completely instead. And, and I know we've seen some of that over the years where people have gone to trying to do their research with a non-radioactive item instead of always using radioactive material if it's possible. But another method is also to use a material that can be easily decontaminated. So if you can clean a material and put it back out for free release and reuse, then that removes it from your waste stream um, also. Uh, we mentioned uh, that one method for disposal is to dispose of uh, your effluents in a sanitary sewer system. That is an actual regulation, 10 CFR 20.2003. This is a pretty specific regulation. It does have to be an allowed activity in your radioactive materials license and application. The material that you want to put down the sanitary sewer has to be basically water-based. It's got to be readily soluble and dispersible in water. So nothing on the organic natures that your public uh, treatment works would not take too kindly for. Um, it's also very specific limits for the radionuclides and their concentrations and how much you can discharge. And there are monthly limits as well as annual overall limits. In order to meet those limits, you have to know how much water you're putting down your systems uh, in general, not just with the radioactive material, but how much water you use at your facility. And just as a keynote here, it's definitely got to be non recro hazardous. You may have an aqueous based waste stream like an acid or an alkaline corrosive material. Um, but if you do your hazardous waste characterization first, you can't simply send that material down the drain. You'd have to meet all RECRA LDR treatment requirements as well. So keep in mind that any sanitary sewer releases are for primarily aqueous water-based materials and nothing that could be RECRA hazardous like a corrosive or a metal bearing waste. So uh, a common exemption that's out there is um, what we often call the um, scintillation media declassification or exemption. So the following two uh, wastes may be managed as non-radioactive under that 
10 CFR 20.2005 exemption. So if you have tritium or carbon in uh, scintillation fluid at less than 0.05 microcuries per gram of the scintillant, uh, that would be exempt, as well as uh, the same level, less than 0.05 microcuries of tritium or carbon uh, in an animal or animal tissue averaged over the entire weight of the animal, that also would be considered exempt, and those could be managed as non-radioactive material. Uh, over here, you see a common, uh, the form that we use um, to have the customer certify that the materials are no longer uh, or are exempt under these uh, regulation under this regulation. There's three boxes to check. One is saying that the material is unused scintillation fluid one that is used but fall, falls under those less than 0.05 microcurry per gram limits. And then the third box is actually something we'll cover soon, uh, saying that the material contained other isotopes but has been fully decayed. And here we are, decay and storage. <clears throat> so, um, Radioactive waste and mixed waste can be stored for decay and then managed as non-rad waste. Uh, this is according to 10 CFR 20.2001. This activity has to be allowed in your radioactive materials license, and it can only be for certain isotopes with low uh, half-lives, less than 120 days. So again, this is a performance-based activity, and it uh, so you have to consider the radionuclides, the half-life, the activity present when the materials placed in storage, et cetera. Uh, again, if you're talking about microcuries versus millicuries versus curies of activity, it may take you more than those 10 half-lives to decay your curies of activity. Uh, so again, the results uh, um, are uh, in background readings is what you're looking for. So you need to be nothing about background and you have to uh, take those readings in a low background area so that you know there's no background interference um, and done with the appropriate meter for the isotope that you're trying to read. Uh, uh, after you've done that and you've been through your 10 half lives and uh, uh, everything is at background, you then need to make sure that all radioactive markings and labels are obliterated or removed. And there's also a conditional exemption that exists for mixed waste, uh, which allows you to uh, store your mixed waste for greater than your 90 or 180 day clock. However, you must apply ahead of time uh, for each specific waste stream you wish to apply this exemption to. So that is where it can be a little tricky. Um, and the conditional exemption there is 40 uh, CFR part 266 and part N. So again, after all your decay is done, uh, you can manage those wastes uh, for either recycling, disposal, non-hazardous, or hazardous, uh, whatever they are, without radioactive uh, content. Roger mentioned we were going to talk about labeling. It's a pretty important part of waste inventorying. When you label your radioactive material um, by regulation, uh, 10 CFR 20.1904, you're required to have, at a minimum, the radioactive trifoil symbol and the words caution radioactive material. Past that, the regulation only states that you have to have enough information uh, provided on the label to allow workers to take precautions and minimize exposures if they're near those containers. And this could include a list of the isotopes that are present in that container and the activities, and very importantly, the units. And it could be in any form of, you know, curies or, heaven forbid for me, uh, becquerels. Um, but the unit's really important to put on there so that it's clear to uh, someone in the area. Also, the date for which the activity is estimated, that's particularly important if you've got a short half-life material. If you've got a material that's you know given off a, a pretty good amount of radiation, put the radiation level directly on there as well. It's a good indicator for someone in the area. Is it you know background type material that's low level or are you upwards of the five MR per hour, 10 MR per hour near that material? That's a good thing to know. And finally, a description of the material. Um, is it uh, solid dry active waste? Is it some type of liquid? If the material is also RECRA hazardous, you also need to maintain all of your RECRA labels on there, as well as any chemical constituents for that material. 
the area also has to be posted also. So here we have an example of uh, multiple postings. And it can say various different things. So the caution radioactive materials is the one that's most predominant. And that means that you've got more than 10 times the Appendix C limits. But most times people post automatically purely for hazard communication from an OSHA standpoint. There are required postings when you get higher than that. If you've got a material that gives off 5 MR per hour greater than 30 centimeters from the source, you have to post that material as a radiation area shown here. There's also ones for high radiation area, very high radiation area. And then if you've got an airborne contaminated area, and you know, in some cases, just for user use, the symmetry required for entry. So some of the ones are required by regulation, others are good for hazard communication. Disposal records. Uh, record keeping is a really big part of your license. So shown here, we've got an NRC manifest. We'll talk about the shipping papers first. Um, NRC manifests, when you ship the material off site, are required by their called an NRC Form 540 and a Form 541. They had some revisions to those regulations in 2021. They just took effect a couple months ago in June. Some of the changes to those included uh, electronic option boxes if you're using your manifest electronically. Uh, there was some language changes to the DOT certification. And also on the 541, there's now a waste weight section. So now you've got a gross weight section and a net weight section to better define how much waste you have in that package. Uh, if your material is also hazardous, you've also got a has waste manifest that's uh, going to be applicable for this. Uh, that also includes a land disposal restriction form if your material requires one. And when you ship your material off site, you're required to verify that the location you're shipping it to, most predominantly a specific licensed low level waste processor, are they authorized to receive your specific waste? One method to do this is to get a copy of the processor's license. Compare it to the material that you're shipping, make sure they match, and then keep that document on file. If your processor um, gives you an abbreviated license, that's fine, as long as you can still verify the information. An alternate method would be to get something in writing from them indicating that they're authorized to handle the waste that you're shipping to them. These records have to be maintained basically until license termination, in some cases, three years. And all these records include anything you could do with your waste. So shipping it off site to a processor, disposing of it in a sanitary sewer, if you're managing exempt material, and this is all part of your inventory process for your license as well. And then also for decaying storage, all again, keep all the records that you can uh, for a minimum of three years, in some cases until license termination, or if your state requires a different time period as well. And um, a little bit on training as well. And this is again, part of your license. Any worker or employee who may receive greater than 100 MR per year, that's the public dose limit, has to receive radiation safety training. This training could include uh, radiation health effects, precautions and procedures to reduce personal exposure, um, any reporting that's required. So uh, if you see something that doesn't look quite right at your site, you're required to report to your RSO or any authority in your company that something isn't right. So you see it, you say something. Uh, emergency response procedures, People who are handling radioactive materials should be trained some level of emergency response, even if it's just leave the area, secure the area, and make sure that everybody's safe. Uh, and then subsequent cleanup occurs afterward. Exposure reporting procedures. Uh, if you have a dosimetry issued to you by your company, you're allowed to request your records at any given time period. Uh, in addition to that, anything waste specific. So if you're generating a waste on your site, um, how do I handle this material? How do I store it? What kind of containers do I put it in? Um, how do I keep it safe and restricted access? Um, 
what record keeping do I need in terms of inventory to, to make sure that my material is accounted for? Uh, any waste acceptance criteria, if you're packaging material directly for a processor, make sure you're packaging it correctly so you're not mixing up different waste streams that could lead to a rejection later on down the line or added cost to your facility. And then finally, if you was ever putting their pen down on that manifest and signing that Form 540, needs to be DOT trained for class seven radioactive materials, not just all the other hazard classes. It's a specific training. This includes classification, packaging, marking, labeling, and placarding, and it's function specific. So you may not need all the class seven regulations, just the ones that pertain to you as a shipper of the material that you have. Um, in addition, Roger mentioned earlier as well, when you put those containers on the road, they've got to be smeared for contamination and conduct those freight surveys. And again, if you've got a service provider, they do a lot of this information for you. But again, who's ever signing that manifest does need to be specifically trained. Okay, we'll uh, talk about some off-site treatment and disposal options. Um, when we talk about treatment facilities and volume reduction, uh, we're talking about ways to reduce the size of what uh, your, that treatment facility is ultimately putting into a landfill. So uh, again, there's uh, mechanical and thermal ways to reduce those volumes. Uh, standard compaction ratios range anywhere from two to six times uh, and are pretty efficient, uh, but there's also uh, shredding options for to help uh, bulky or odd shaped items uh, fit or compact better. Uh, and then there's bailing for bulk light gauge uh, metals uh, again, uh, those can be tightened up and, and fit better. And then there's repackaging or sorting uh, that the facility can do to place materials either into the compaction category or into the thermal incineration category or possibly even into uh, a recycling category, but potentially where they could decontaminate and recycle. Uh, so on the thermal side, uh, you're going to end up with ash, obviously, uh, from your incineration, your evaporation. You're going to end up with some scale uh, and, and small amounts. And your thermal boiler uh, treatment, you're going to end up, uh, it's, it's prim primarily small amounts of ash there as well. And that's more for your organic waste, uh, but also some, uh, some aqueous solutions can be treated that way as well. So the sustainable options, as we mentioned, uh, are uh, decontamination, uh, recycle and reuse. Uh, there's certain mechanical and chemical procedures you can follow to uh, thoroughly decontaminate large pieces of equipment uh, to remove outer surfaces, paint or coatings, uh, mechanical uh, scraping or um, sandblasting, media blasting, chemical dipping or, or scrubbing. Uh, all those to possibly free release and recycle and reuse, or uh, there's also, you could melt uh, metal or lead and use it as shielding uh, or to be recycled. Uh, and, and again, uh, any decontamination you can do at that end uh, would certainly put less into the landfills. Um, just a quick uh, slide here on mixed waste. Uh, there are options available for pretty much any type of mixed waste that's out there. A lot of it is uh, thermally managed, burned for fuel and an energy uh, for energy recovery in a boiler or industrial furnace. There's also thermal desorption for solid materials that have been absorbed with organics. So you put it in a batch oven, you heat up the solids, the condensate gets thermally treated, and um, the solids get tested for... Um, land disposal restriction standard. Uh, other options, basically standard hazardous waste options, stabilization, solidification, macro encapsulation. For neutralization, uh, we're talking about uh, adjusting a pH of material, and then those liquids go for uh, thermal treatment. And then there's other specialty treatments that are available. So if you've got a Tosco regulated PCB material that's also radioactive, or you've got some mercury materials, there's options available. So years back, there was a lot of legacy wastes 
And nowadays, there's pretty much a treatment option for just about every type of waste. Everything basically ends up in the landfill. Either you ship directly to a landfill for disposal or uh, you have your process residuals. So you compact and size reduce, volume reduce your materials or the ash generated from these thermal options, incineration or, or, the, or the boiler all ends up in the landfill. Uh, encapsulated sources also go to landfill. So these are sources that are placed inside um, four inch concrete molds um, capped off with cement for shielding and then those go directly to a landfill also. Uh, there are four commercial landfills in the U.S., uh, Texas, South Carolina, Utah, and Washington State, and they do different things. Some accept mixed waste, some don't, some accept radium, some don't, and uh, your service provider and your waste processor manages all of those things. Uh, there's also some specialty sites for exempt materials. These are exempt from NRC regulations, but still considered radioactive. And the benefit of these sites is that uh, it's a simpler approval process and a, a cheaper cost usually as well. Um, lastly, on compacts, compacts are agreements between different states where one state agrees to be the host state. So you can see uh, the map that we've got here. And most of them are kind of broken up geographically, except for Texas and Vermont. I don't know what they were thinking because they couldn't be farther away. But Vermont and Texas are, are a partner in this case. So one state agrees to be the host state for disposal. Now, in order for your processor to ship into these places, um, some states have to have, a, some compacts have to have permission. So you may need an import permit to get your material into that compact. And as a generator, you may be required to participate in some of that process. Includingly, some compacts, you have to ex get an export permit to get your waste out of that compact. So some of the uh, import ex export ones are listed here. And then again, there are some unaffiliated states who did not band together to form a compact. And right now they're still more or less allowed to ship to all of the processing facilities. Uh, in the disposal unit, disposal companies, but uh, that may change in the future as capacity goes down. So I think that's about uh, all we've got for you on our radioactive waste teaser. Jim? All right. Thank you, uh, Liza and Roger. That was, uh, I know it's trying to condense a lot of information into a short period of time. Um, you did a great job. Uh, this one I always kind of put in there. If someone were to ask you, what did you learn on your webinar? Um, you've obviously been taking your own, own notes, but I detailed or distilled it down to maybe these points. Um, in the interest of time, we've got about uh, 13 minutes for your questions. I think I'm just going to skip this slide and we will go right to Q&A. Uh, so let me pull that up. I've been trying to summarize the questions and capture them. Um, is licensing required for healthcare facilities? I'll take that one. Um, it's a bit of a bit of an open-ended question. By healthcare facility, and I'm, I'm just going to kind of pull some intent here. If you mean a, a facility that injects radioactive material into patients, uh, that's what I'm assuming that you're meaning. And the answer would be yes. That's an even more specific type of license. So I, I hope I answered your question. Uh, correctly. Basically, if you've got a byproduct material over an exempt amount, and those are in the regs, you would be required to have a license. Okay. Thank you. Very much related. Uh, lead aprons used in shielding during x-rays, are they exempted? Um, if you're using an x-ray material, your lead apron should not be radioactive. So the radioactive material passes through the lead apron, but doesn't get contaminated. Uh, the lead apron doesn't get contaminated. So those would not be radioactive waste. Roger, would you suggest a lead recycler for that? Yes, yeah, those could go to uh, any of your metal recyclers that uh, can accept lead. Uh, if for some reason they were uh, contamination on, on your lead blankets or lead uh, sheets, you could uh, send them for decontamination uh, and then recycling. But again, what you're what you're saying, what you're suggesting for for X-rays, they shouldn't be contaminated with any radioactive material. Okay. 
Um, kind of a specific question. I don't know if someone asking if this was pre-approved for continuing education credits. I don't think we have. Maybe, Liza, we can talk offline afterwards to see. Um, so anyway, it was kind of more of, hey, could we get CE for this? Um, we can look into it. Okay. Uh, I had a comment about question about the term exemption in quotes. This does not necessarily mean exempt from a license and then a smiley icon. Um, so I think that was, again, probably there are a lot of ways to, to sure. cut it closely, but I don't know if you have a comment on that. Um, well, you have to know what regulation you're talking about, too. So um, there are, like I said, exemptions from radioactive material, but it doesn't mean that it isn't radioactive material. It can still be radioactive but not necessarily subject to a license. Okay. Um, we have one here. Uh, where is it? What about H3 slash C14 in hazardous, uh, I think it's liquid scintillation, um, uh, and SNC standards, are they exempt? Ah. Okay, so the standards that you use to um, calibrate your counter, uh, get an SDS on those. They usually say toluene, um, so it's kind of a little bit misleading, and it is important to get an SDS in this case. Uh, they, they do have simulation cocktail in them, otherwise the counter would not be able to read them to use. So we do feel those are considered exempt. They usually have about 100,000 DPM in them, which is well under the uh, 0.05 microcurie per gram limit. Okay. Uh, a question now about decay. Uh, should the bins that we use to allow LLRW to decay in storage be lined with lead, or should the decay in storage room have lead walls? Or lead yes, that would, that would depend on what you're decaying um, and if it was the appropriate shielding for what you're decaying. Okay, so or, or one of those answers. Yes. Um, there's, there, there's often better materials you can use to decay. So if you're decaying something like P32 or P33, Plexi. you're looking for a, a high Z material. So plastic, um, uh, lucite are typically better for shielding those types of materials. Hmm. Okay. Uh, question specifically about what services we offer. Does Veolia help get the processor's license? Roger, you provide a copy when you do yes. a shipment, isn't that correct? Y yes, every time, even though it's redundant, and if I ship from the same customer three times a year, each time I will provide them with a copy of the facility's license so that they can keep it on file. We found it helpful to keep it with the manifest all in one package. It's just an easier way for record keeping and everything's all in one packet. Yep. Okay. Um, similar question. Uh, does Veolia offer DOT class training or would, what recommendations would you have for DOT class training? I think it was the class seven uh, that you were talking about. Um, like I mentioned, DOT is function specific. So um, we have done DOT training in the past. We um, don't necessarily have a perfectly canned program for it. It would be more uh, customer specific. Um, we, we, we can do it. That, I guess that's the easy answer. And, and we have done it in the past. It's usually by special request. Okay. Uh, do we need to record how long low-level rad waste decays in storage? Um, yes and no. Uh, previously, Roger mentioned it was a performance-based standard. Previously, you used to say, hey, store your material for about 10 half-lives. And they did away with that and, and made it more performance-based um, because 10 half-lives for some materials and some activities starting out just isn't enough. And other times uh, it's, it's a ridiculous amount of time if your material is very, very short lived. Um, however, if you are storing it for decay, we recommend putting a date on it. If you're decaying something like I-125, uh, which is gonna take almost two years to, to decay, I'm not gonna remember when I put that in storage. Um, so it would be helpful to put a storage date on that. But you know, my, Again, my memory isn't what it used to be either. Right, it's all in the details and record keeping. If you keep all that uh, information clear and precise, 
you'll know exactly when your uh, expected uh, half-lives have been met and required. Okay, good, thank you. Um, here's a question, I think going back to the DOT uh, training question, is there a refresher cycle uh, for that? How often do you have to have the DOT training? Uh, DOT is standard every three years for um, domestic shipments. So that would be on a, on a definite three-year cycle. You would have to meet that. Okay. Um, here's kind of a three-parter. Uh, what about long-lived RAM waste mixed with controlled substances? Uh, what's the best way to dispose of them? And is treatment needed before shipment? I can touch base on that. Uh, the uh, controlled substances do need to be managed first uh, with either a letter uh, from the DEA saying that they approve of whatever method you use to stabilize or uh, render unusable the uh, the substance, uh, and then we can manage it as radioactive waste. Okay. Um, see, so we had a couple more just come in now. Um, do brand new packaging slash boxes need to be swiped for outbound contamination surveys? So the letter of DOT, um, you have to meet the regulation in, I think it's 173.443, um, if my memory serves me correctly. I understand what you're saying, though. If you are if you walk in with a brand new package, you package your material and you're walking back out. If you know that material is sealed in a bag or inner container that was clean, and you're for sure certain that you're not causing contamination on the exterior of that container, then yeah, I mean, you could use some latitude to do that. But it's, you know, up to you to be able to prove that you're not putting a package out on the road that exceeds the contamination levels for DOT. Okay, and here, here we have a, a, a hypothetical question. Um, what is, the, if I had old uncharacterized rad waste that was subject to poor record keeping, what is the best way to move forward with that, hypothetically? Um, well, Roger, you can jump in here if you disagree. If it's a liquid material, you could send it out for a sample. Um, there's lots of radioactive laboratories that can sample, and they can do broad, uh, wide open for uh, beta and gamma radiation. Um, if it's a solid material or material that's too difficult to sample, you can take some surveys, which will give you a little bit of an idea as to whether or not um, your material is still active, assuming you've got a meter that reads that. Um, you could do um, look at at your license and try to you know pull some historical information to see what it could be uh, as well. So you know use your license limits and what isotopes you have available on your license, maybe some historical records if you've changed that license over time and do the best you can to try to characterize that material. But, you know, make sure it all fits. If it's labeled radioactive, chances are it's got something in there, unless you did a lot of decaying storage back then. Um, or if you've got a meter, you can, uh, you know, try to, at least if you know your isotopes, you can use a meter or some analytical to determine your activity. Okay. Um, one question, if we can do it real quick. Uh, if administration vials contain less than a milliliter of residual LU-177 uh, in a glass vial, could these be considered dry waste? You're talking about, I'm sorry, is that a tiny amount of liquid in a material? Yeah, less than one milliliter of residual, and I don't know what the, what the LU-177 is, I'm sure you do. Um, would that be considered dry, less than a milliliter? Um, if you had less than a milliliter and you had a couple of those vials in your dry waste, that's probably okay. If, you know, you've got a thousand of them in there and you go to send that material for processing and they compact it and a large amount of liquid comes out, that would not be okay. So that's kind of, you know, um, a little bit of thought process there as to how you're generating the material. You know, if, if you've got a mill in there and you can't pour it out, um, yeah, then I would consider that to be dry waste. You know, that, that kind of goes in the, if you can't empty it, um, then it would, it would be considered dry. 
But if you had a large quantity of, of the same type of material that could end up being a lot of liquid on the on the end, um, then that then I would reconsider. Okay. Well, great. That's uh, all the time we have. Um, certainly, like to thank everybody. We had a couple people ask if they're going to get a copy uh, of the of the webinar. You will. Um, probably this evening you'll get the PDF uh, of the deck as well as the link to the recording. Uh, we haven't scheduled our next webinar, but it will be in the new year, probably in January. So keep an eye on our uh, Violi's homepage or your inbox. We'll probably send you an invite. And we're about to uh, wrap things up here. But if you stay on for just a moment after I close things off, there's a short one question survey to let us know how we did. Um, so please let us know. Uh, and this now ends the webinar. Thank you, everybody, for attending and for your participation. Thank you. Thank you.